The Art of the Pivot is brought to you by Signavio. Hello there and welcome to Art of the Pivot. I am your host, Mark Jeffries, and joining us today is Susan Rothwell, Chief Revenue Officer for Vericast, a leading marketing solutions company that helps brands connect with their ideal customers using predictive intelligence and analytics. As Vericast Chief Revenue Officer, Susan focuses on enhancing the client experience and is responsible for the company's sales performance. Susan's been with Vericast for 15 years, where she's held multiple leadership roles, and her expertise in driving the sales organization's evolution and go-to-market strategies has delivered significant positive results. That's good news, Susan. Um, welcome. Yeah. Uh, where do we find you today? Oh, hi, Mark. It's great to be here. You find me outside of Philadelphia, where I've been held up for most of the pandemic. And uh, it's great because we've uh, finally gotten out uh, to meet some customers and see some associates. So things are getting back to a little bit of normalcy. I know, isn't it nice? And it's so funny getting back into airports and on planes and they're so busy. Uh, everyone is just desperate for that human to human contact. All right, we'll talk more about that in a while. Now, for those okay. who aren't too familiar with the business, give us kind of the, the elevator pitch, if you would, for Vericast. Tell us about the company. Well, Vericast is really a marketing solutions company. Uh, we focus every day on connecting our customers and with their customers. And it's, it's really about using our data and insight to help our customers do that. Believe it or not, Mark, we've been in business for about 140 years and have quickly innovated and reinvented ourselves. So been around for a while. Um, and we have a great knowledge of our customer and our consumer base and everything that they do. We use this proprietary data and insights and rich media intelligence in order to help them. I'm going to guess These days, that the you know, marketing challenge was a little different 140 years ago. Oh, yes, I would say so. Um, and, you know, I don't think they had a lot of data like we do nowadays, right? And uh, I think that data that I was talking about earlier is, is really different for us because we use that data to activate and uh, use our technology to help our customers. And, and that's really a basis of what we do and how we engage with them. Along with 140 years, we uh, we also you know have a vast array of, of assets such as we get into 120 million households a day. So we have these great on and offline products that we offer to our customers as well. Right. I, I want to talk all about that. So as I understand it, a little over a year ago, your company announced quite the relaunch of the business. And obviously, with 140 years behind you, this has probably happened before. But clearly, this was a big move, especially for your business, a business with roots that, that really do go back over all that time. So tell me about what you see as, as the power of uni unification and what were the key drivers behind the relaunch? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we prior to the relaunch, we were operating as four separate units. We had Harlan Clark, we had Clipper, we had NCH, we had Velasis. And under these units, we all were very successful with separate P&Ls. And what we were able to do is we were able to look at those assets and bring those assets under one, which is called Vericast. And that allows us to take our solutions, our data, and our go-to-market strategies and combine them under that one entity. So, you know, therefore, it was really our path to unifying. And it also made it easier for our customers to work for, with us and see all the benefits we could offer them. And I actually wanted to pick up on that because obviously when you go through a rebranding and a big reorg, it's got to be with the customers in mind, right? What what were they telling you? What was it, that, the, the message that you saw from customers, from your clients that led you to believe that this change had to happen? Well, you know, it really started really to come and focus about a year and a half ago even more from our customers, right? Our customers saw that we were had different business units and we had different reps actually calling on them. And they were saying to us, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could have one point of contact, one person that could really touch us with everything that we do. So this idea of really unifying Vericast came from our customers wanting to work with us in a, in a broader aspect, but also a little bit of an easier direction as well. 
So it was going to look different, obviously, to the outside, to your customers. This is what they wanted. It was going to feel cleaner and clearer. Internally, though, was it an easier challenge getting everyone to, I guess, um, embrace the new identity and maybe even behave differently? Well, I think uh, once we took the silos down and really understand what each organization had to offer and really had a, perhaps like a peek behind the door and say, hey, what is there? Everybody got really excited because the silos now came down. We had an opportunity to see what everybody had to offer and then be able to really unify that thread. And what that thread is that we help our customers gain gain customers through our insights and data. So once we aligned that, we were able to really understand that this was really a great opportunity, not just for our customers, but internally as well for our, our optimize our go-to-market strategy. All right, it all sounds good. And I guess with a rebrand comes maybe a slightly altered vision. When you look to the future as we, as we continue to emerge out of this pandemic, what is the vision and how is that marketing challenge changing for your customers and for yourselves? Yeah, well, you know, I'll take the second question first. I think the pandemic really accelerated change and not only for our customers, but for ourselves, right? So we've looked at this as an opportunity to accelerate change. Uh, for our customers, it really became that understanding that path to purchase and how can we now grab that customer was, you know, as well as I do, what has happened? We buy online, we pick up in store, all these different things happened. We had different retail locations close. And, and so all that created a dynamic that allowed us to help our customers. We were able to use our data and use our, 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 our intelligence to help them understand when they should be advertising, when they should be doing certain promotions and how they could talk to their customers. So it really was an opportunity as, we, as the customer dramatically changed, we were able to change along with them. And this is a, a tough question, really, but the year has been difficult. You know, a pandemic is not something uh, we should ever welcome having to go through. And there have been a lot of downsides. But the upsides for businesses, especially involving uh, retail online and gathering data, that's really been a positive change, hasn't it? Because now we have more access to more data. There are more digital touch points than ever before. So has it strengthened the world of your customers and their, their need to find the right data at the right time? Yeah, I think that's very challenging for marketers, right? There is a lot of data for them to analyze and to sift through, um, but and the data changed, right? So the signals that you would get from your customer changed through the pandemic. But what it did, it was gave us an opportunity to put those insights, those data and that proprietary intelligence into work for our customers so that they could create that personalized experience. They could meet their customer where they were. And they were able to use that so that they could pivot and, and, and be able to make their business continue to go and grow through the pandemic. So the ability for us to pivot ourselves and the, comp the, the customers themselves really was helpful and that we really were able to help a lot of them. So like, for example, um, you know, we work with financial institutions and branches closed, right? And all of a sudden their customers were trying to go online or trying to engage in different ways. And we were able to use our data and our insights to help our financial institutions through that. Yeah, fantastic. And I know that you guys are very proud of the fact that you help your customers influence consumer purchase and transaction behavior, and you do it at scale. So this is not about, you know, single moments. It's about finding a way to do this across the board for different industries, different blueprints. To me, that sounds fascinating. Um, what does it mean for you? How does this at scale challenge come into play? Yeah, so that's one of the powers of Veracast, right? We get into 120 million households on a daily basis, either through our online or our offline products, print or digital products. So that's a great amount of scale for us to have to be able to meet the needs of our customers. 
What I think is really important is we are able to take that scale and scale it up and down according to what their needs are and using, you know, understanding our, our data of what are people buying? What are their lifestyles? Where do they choose the shop? What products do they want now or they don't want? And, and what are their savings preferences? So we use all these different types of data points that helps our, help our customers be able to decide when and where they want to launch a campaign or use that data for their business. But a lot of the businesses we speak to and I meet when I'm hosting events talk about finding a very personal, direct connection with a consumer, with a customer. And so that means not just creating a couple of broad personas. It's about understanding everyone. How easy is that to do when you're reaching 120 million households a day? Well, that's really based in our, our tech stack, right? And the way that we are able to gather a lot of different information through the way our technology spans out there, understanding some mobile mobile intent and understanding what people are searching online and, and content they're reading and, and where is their Tele where is their phone going and things like that. So we're able to gather all these different points of interest and create a, an audience for our customers and be able to, again, create that personalized one-to-one -one because what a customer wants is they want to be able to have that personal one-to-one -one experience and be able to serve up relevant ads that, are, that mean something to their customers so that they're really right. able to be able to activate them in the way they want to be activated with an offer the way they want to be activated as well. I'm always fascinated by how I'll watch a quick YouTube video on a new gadget, uh, or I'll be talking about something with my wife, and suddenly I'm seeing these adverts based exactly on what I was just looking at, popping up all <laughs> yeah. over the show, which at first is like, wow, how cool. And then suddenly I'm freaked out, obviously. Right. So mm -hmm. consumer privacy is, is a big thing. It's highly valued. How do you guys just tread that tightrope? between responding to that increasing consumer desire for personalization, but at the same time, not wanting to be freaked out by anything that uh, looks like a lack of privacy. Yeah, the, well, as you know, it's really in the news right now. Like everybody's talking about privacy and cookies and IP addresses and all those things that help uh, marketers identify individuals. So, you know, what we've done here at Veracast is we are really, focusing on using our technology to make sure we can still allow our customers to engage, but also make sure it's in a privacy protected. We recently introduced a targeting approach that uniquely connects data to households in a manner that respects consumers' privacies and choices and is not relying on cookies and device IDs. And that will really really help our customers. And, and the product is called Household Connect. And that's a, a patent pending product that will allow us to, again, help our customers find their customers in a very privacy protected manner. So we're super excited to introduce that technology. Um, and forgive me, because I'm not an expert in this area, but I've read recently how Google and other similar organizations mm -hmm. are changing the way cookies work. They're being removed uh, in certain places. Does that make the job harder for you and your team? Um, well, yes, and of course it makes it harder for everyone because that's the way that we have been, you know, gathering data, third party data is by doing that. Um, however, by the ability, the way our tech stack was built, uh, we actually built it more on the basis of audiences as opposed to specific individuals. So we're able right. to use the basis of our tech stack so that we don't have to be cookie reliant or IP reliant in order to get the information to serve our customers better. All right. Good to know. Thank you. I'm always uh, yeah. very interested to, uh, to find out how successful organizations and leaders like yourself structure their teams. Tell me a bit about your sales team. How do they operate? How do they interact with other teams in the organization? Yeah, so the sales team evolved along the way with uh, Veracast as well, right? So uh, as we unified Veracast, we unified our sales organization. And our sales organization is very focused on being client first, right? And using data and insights to help our clients. And that goes along the lines with all of our support teams. So our data scientists, our analysts, 
our customer service reps are all aligned to our customers and our sales teams to make sure they're getting the best in, in experience they possibly can get um, as we execute campaigns for them. So we've aligned the sales teams according to verticals, we've aligned them with their support teams, and we have a deep breadth of focus and knowledge in our verticals so that we can really be that expert as the customers engage us. Right, and you get to a point where you can create very insightful blueprints that within that vertical focus, you can go to other organizations and say, look, this is how it works, and it works really well. Um, I'm, I'm also interested on, on your perspective on that magical moment when a salesperson um, shifts into being a trusted advisor. It's a very powerful moment. Is, is that something that you, you push from your sales team, or do you like them to stay very much focused on, on the sell? No, we really want them to be focused on helping our customers solve their problems. And I think the pandemic, again, was a really good example of that, right? So we had a lot of customers pull back and were very, very concerned about, you know, how they were going to engage their customers. So instead of making sales calls, we spent our time informing them with a lot of insights and data that let them know what was going on, what states were open, what states were closed. And it really ended up becoming becoming a much more consultative approach. We always leave with data and insights, like I mentioned before, because then that allows us to really understand the customer. And then the, oh, by the way, is the products that support that, that the products that activate that, that custo customer for them. Let me ask you one other question on data. You know, we live in a world uh, where we are inundated with every aspect of data we could imagine. It's like being a kid walking into a candy store. Do we yet know, as, as, as an industry, the right questions to ask of this data? You say we always lead with data first, but my question to you is how do we know it's the right type of data for the right person at the right time? How do we go about finding a way through that challenge? Yeah, so, uh, you know, data has many different le levels to it, right? And many different ways of looking at the data. And so when we talk about, as I said, it's a very broad aspect. What we do at Veracast is we really break the data down to make sure we are using the data to address the customer problem. So for instance, um, for restaurants right now, as I talked about, they have a challenge with understanding how is their guests going to engage with them? Are they going to order online, pick up in store, have delivery? all these elements of, of how that customer journey will happen. And what we're able to do is we're able to utilize our graph and our intelligence to help them say, these are the, how your customers are reacting. We'll sometimes use their data, ingest that as well, and help them analyze that so that we can really be a partner with them to understand how data can be used to help them make the right decisions. Yeah, it's an ongoing journey, clearly. That's yes. great. Thank you for that. You learn, you learn, um, you learn, Ruth. Yeah, absolutely right. Our, our time is almost up. So a couple of questions uh, remaining. When okay. you look at the transformation your business has just gone through and, and how it all feels so new and different and you got the whole team working in, in a very much an aligned fashion, is there anything you or, or the leadership would have done differently? Uh, we have a lot of people who watch and want to learn from people like you. Is there anything that you learned from this entire exercise where you look back and think, yeah, you know, maybe we should have done that slightly differently? Yeah, I think there's always opportunities to iterate whatever we do. And I think uh, even through this journey of, of launching Veracast and the unification of the company, I think you always sit back and you should, as a good leader, take a look and say what worked and what didn't work and iterate on that. And I think... Yeah we always need to over communicate right we need to over communicate to our customers what we're doing our associates what we're doing and making sure that we really let everybody be a part of the journey along the way and understanding the, the reason for the changes as well as the value of those changes you know not only to our our company but more importantly to the customers we serve very good. All right. That leads us to our last question. And uh, I always like looking ahead to the future. So what's next? What's next for you, for Veracast? I don't expect you to go 140 years into the future, but maybe okay. a year down the line. 
Yeah, well, so I'm hoping, you know, this really is just as we talked about at the beginning, right? We are focused on our customer, we're, as we were talking about, the, the reinvention of our brand, the utilization of our, our data and our platforms, and we're also focused on our employees. And we really have a lot of initiatives from diversity and inclusion to our uh, employee wellness to really make sure that we continue to evolve because at Veracast, you know, we're, we believe in integrity, we believe in re reliability differences. And, you know, I hopefully a year from now, I get an opportunity to talk to you and, and be able to let you know how well this worked, right? Because we're passionate about this. We're passionate about our customers. We're passionate about our employees. And we're passionate to, about this journey that's really important that we pivot to, you know, as Veracast starts to launch its brand in the marketplace. I can see that there's a lot of passion, a lot of energy, a lot of excitement <laughs> yeah. for a business with 140 years of history. And I suspect many years into the future, Susan Rothwell, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your insight and your ideas. Thank you. Thank you. The Art of the Pivot is brought to you by Signavio.